Johnson, and I'm the chair of the Department of Curriculum Instruction. In case you don't know me, most of you have never seen me before, that's fine. Um, it's always been my dream to stand up and on stage in front of a large crowd and sing, but I won't be singing today. So, uh, I'm here to get us started with the orientation, uh, so please have a seat. There'll be people coming in. Um, how many of you plan to teach? Woo! I want to start with a positive response from the audience, so I thought that would be safe. Um, welcome to a fall semester. I know the temperatures are a little warm, um, but uh, it's going to soon cool off, and we're going to have a great year. Um, we have a lot of stuff to cover today. Uh, we have introductions, and then we're going to have some breakout groups and things like that. So. Uh, you don't want to sit here and listen to an old guy talk all day, so what I'm going to do next is uh, turn it over to our dean, Teresa Doty, and uh, she's got a few slides to go through, and, uh, and then we're going to have our faculty introduce themselves and, and get on with the program. So uh, let me introduce our dean of the College of Education, who is starting her fourth year, uh, Dr. Teresa Doty. To start off the school year. Tomorrow classes begin and um, and I'm excited to say this, as Dan said, this is my fourth year here so I feel like I'm going into my senior year. <laughs> Always fun. Student teaching is ahead, all that good stuff. But I am delighted. This is uh, two years running now that, that we, we uh, in terms of enrollment, that we have seen increases in students who want to be teachers. And so we are thrilled to, to welcome all of you. Uh, you know, this is an absolutely amazing profession in which to serve. Uh, you all truly make a difference in the lives of not only the children you will be teaching, but for their families and the community in which, those, in which you're serving. Um, amazing differences that you all will make. And I tell you what's, what's so nice is that you'll discover that years later, you will come across a former student who will come up to you and say, thank you, you were my favorite teacher and you made a difference. And I'll tell you, it may take 20 years for that to happen, but it is one of the most rewarding, it, it totally tells you, this is why I do what I do. I have been an educator now, this is starting my 36th year. I know I don't look that old. But 36 years as an educator, and I was actually in special education. And I'm excited to say that we have a special ed program here now, and you'll meet some of the faculty later on, and um, we are growing those numbers as well. But at the same time, we have many other areas of educator preparation not only for preparing outstanding teachers, but also preparing school administrators, principals, superintendents, as well as personnel to work in higher education. So once you finish your undergraduate work, if you want to go into your graduate work, we do that here too. So as you can see up here, I actually put a pronunciation up here because I always find it funny. Often when I'm introduced, it's Dr. Dowdy. <coughs> what your little 
and you're going to be prepared to work with every child as you enter the classroom as a teacher. Let's see, what else do I have? So some of the key things that we are preparing you to do, but you should expect to do as an educator, is working with families to assure that their children are coming to school ready to learn. That uh, they're physically, mentally, socially, and emotionally. And sometimes that means that we stay after school or we go meet the parents at McDonald's to have a meeting just to make sure their children are getting their needs met and that you're communicating with those families. Engage all students in their own learning and embrace all evidence-based instructional methods. Uh, one of the really neat things about education is that we're evidence-driven. We don't just make things up. It's like, oh yeah, sure, we'll try that. If there's an evidence base, mainly if you can go through the research and say, oh, look, that method is proven to work, those are the kind of methods you're going to be using in your classroom, and those are the methods you're learning about now. Be prepared to understand research and how different students learn and to use data. One of the, uh, I, I actually sent a couple of studies to Dr. Curtis. Where's Dr. Curtis? There she is right there. I sent two studies to her yesterday because we were chatting about, I don't know, we're born, data collection. Um, but we were talking about the accuracy of teachers' data based on when they take those data. So for example, if you've got a child who is spelling out loud to you, do you immediately write down on your paper correct or incorrect? Do you wait until the end of the day or do you wait until tomorrow to write that down? And when you think about how, when's going to be the most accurate time to gather that data, when do you think it's going to be? It's going to be immediately after the child spells the word aloud to you. That's when you're going to have the most accurate. Well, we actually did two studies to ask that question. And lo and behold, imagine that. Right after the student does whatever the behavior is, that's the best time to record that data. Yet when you walk into any classroom, that's not what you're seeing on most days. And so what we have to figure out as professionals is identify what data we need to be collecting regularly and then how do we make it manageable throughout the day because not only are we having to teach little Johnny here, but then we've got Sally over here that is learning maybe something a little different and we can't take data on both of them at the same time because we're only working with one of them at a time. So it can be challenging, but we do use data and we do collect data and we make decisions on what students need to learn next based on their data. We use different formats and groupings in how we teach students. You know, it's great to work with a child one-on-one, -on -one, but children learn in all different kind of ways. I mean, I love large group, small group, peer mentoring. I love activity-based instruction. So mixing it up in your classroom, as opposed to every child sitting at their desk in line just as recipients of your knowledge, that's not good teaching. You want them moving around, engaged, and trying different ways to learn what you are trying to teach them, what you want them to learn. We're going to embed different technologies. And later on this morning, you're going to have um, a chance from the TCEA, thank you, TCEA, technology something or other. Um, whatever the CA is, I don't know what the CA is, I'm sorry. TCA, it's a big technology organization. Okay. Does it stand for technology or Texas? Okay, it's Texas. You know, I mean, no. But whatever TCA is, they deal with technology stuff. They're going to talk to you about some of the technology we use in education. And, and as you all know, I mean, you all have been using technology probably since you were born because it's been around since you were born. But it continues to evolve and the way we're using it in classrooms continues to change. I can tell you that this year, we've got some exciting things that uh, we're doing. The president gave the college a gift of technology this year. And so we have invested in a lot of different technology that you'll have an opportunity to use as you are preparing for the classroom. We've got new smart board-like devices. We've got robots. We've got Ozobots that you might use for coding and learning how to teach coding skills. 
Um, the range is quite wide, but the president is incredibly supportive of the work we're doing and the teachers that we're preparing that he decided that this year he really needed to invest in us and so he he gave us a pretty large gift <clears throat> and so your instructors will be exposing you to a lot of the really cool technology that we've acquired so that you can learn how to use that in your classrooms we want to make sure that you're thinking outside the box that books are a nice supplement but if you need to teach a child how to, I don't know, do um, build an amusement park, and you want to integrate math and science and literacy in that task, think outside the box. How will you teach that? Are they going to sit at a computer and design it, or are they going to work in groups, or are they going to actually go to a lab and physically build a miniature version of an amusement park and have to use all those math language and science skills to do that. That's in your imagination. It's up to you to, to figure out what's going to be a great way to teach that so children are learning skills. We're serving all children. Every child who walks in our door is one of our kids. And in fact, when I think of all children, it's that as a teacher in a class, in a school, you're actually responsible for every child in that school. If you encounter a child in the hallway who needs your support, that's your responsibility as that education professional to provide the support that that child needs. It may not be to teach that child chemistry on the spot, but it's certainly your responsibility to help whatever student is in that building because you're the professional there. We're going to uh, involve technology, include all aspects of a community. We're going to look at what kind of jobs are we preparing students for? Where they live? Where do they want to go? What do their, and we're gonna just take everything into consideration about those communities. One of the cool things that we have here that we're doing with high school students is we have a teacher academy. And I know we've probably got some students who were previously in the first two years of the teacher academy. Are any of you here? Raise your hand if you were in the teacher academy. Maybe they're hiding but we do have some. Um, and one of, the, one of the neat things those students have done is we started them as juniors and seniors in high school to start introducing them to the education profession. And many of them are coming here then to finish their teaching degree. They will then return to their home district and make a difference in their home district as teachers. So it's kind of a grow your own program, which we hope over time will make a tremendous difference. And then our job is also to advocate for the profession. I had a really cool experience over the last year and a half working with other deans across the state where we were preparing for the last legislative session. And I don't know if you watch the news, but education was a hot topic for our lawmakers this past session. And one of the things that I was able to do with this team of other deans was helped change some of the law. Back in the 80s, they decided that you couldn't major in education in Texas. There was no such thing. And so that's why many of you are getting a, a bachelor's degree in interdisciplinary studies. It's because they wouldn't let you do a bachelor's degree in education until April, when the governor signed the bill that said, guess what, in Texas, you can major in education again. So, that's a big deal because I think it brings back the, the focus on this as a true profession, which is what we do. And uh, so we're excited to, we're, we're just changing the name, but I think that name says a lot about how important this field is because without teachers, we don't have engineers, we don't have doctors, we don't have business managers, we don't have any of those other professions without you all, because you all are the ones that are starting the ball rolling, at least starting with the very youngest children. And so that's why, as professionals, we always want to be involved in advocating for our profession. And if there are things that we don't like in our profession, then we need to be part of the professional organizations to help facilitate change. So that's just what we do, and quite frankly, it's a lot of fun. So. I hope that you all have 
just a fabulous year this year. My office is on the fifth floor of Hammond Hall. If you ever have a question or need anything, you have a wonderful department chair, fantastic advisors. In fact, are any of our advisors in the room right now? They're all out in the hallway. So they are awesome, and they're going to be your lifeline if you need anything. You start with the advisors. They, they will get you where you need to go, but if you have other questions, you go to our faculty, and many of them are going to introduce themselves in a minute. Our department chair, I'm here as well. So have a great year, and Dr. Robinson, it's your turn. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to have the faculty line up and so they can come up and introduce themselves one by one. But before I do that, I want to acknowledge uh, somebody who is responsible for putting all of this on, and that's Denise Collins, who's over here in the blue. Thank you. staff from the uh, uh, Department of Curriculum Instruction. Uh, thank you, everybody. I guess I just heard today that next year, instead of Denise, I'm going to be in charge of this. So this will be the last time this goes smoothly. Next year's going to be a complete disaster. So uh, anyway. Yes, recorded. Uh, so I'd like to introduce the faculty of the Department of Curriculum Instruction. If you would get up and, and, and come up, take the microphone, and just introduce yourself, say what area you're in, and anything else interesting, maybe a course you teach that all these students take. How, how come nobody's standing up? See, see, I don't have any authority over these folks. They don't have anything I tell them. Would you please stand up and come up and introduce yourselves? Please? I, I feel like I'm on the animal house. I'm not joking, this is my job.
benefit the bilingual ed program, but if you're taking an ESL course or a bilingual one, you'll be in my classes. Hi, my name is Amanda Olson, and I am also new. Um, I'm an applied quantitative methodologist, so I can help you with all of your research and statistics needs. And I will be working predominantly with graduate students um, in their research methods courses. <laughs> Good morning, my name is Christopher Cribbs. I have a joint appointment with the math department. I do uh, work in elementary and middle grades math education, and this fall I'm teaching the on-campus section of classroom assessment. Good morning, I'm Melissa Healings. I am the program coordinator for middle level certification. I also teach courses, the science methods for EC6, so 4312, I will see you. And I also teach in the mid-level program, and you teach as well. Good morning, everyone. My name is Beth Fleener. I'm the director of Accelerated Online Programs. That means if you're coming back for a master's degree, my office staff will be here to help you. But I also have uh, the joy and honor of teaching the 4311 Math Methods on Monday nights. That's my specialty is elementary mathematics. And in the spring, I am a field supervisor. So some of you could have me, and I can help mentor you. I'm a 10-year public school classroom teacher. Good morning, I am Shubhya Lee and I'm in the ECC program and I teach a mathematics method course in the elementary. So if you are in the EAD 4311, I'll be teaching that course. I look forward to meeting you. Thank you. Good morning, future educators. My name is Brenda Harris and I will be teaching your English language arts methods class and we're going to get everything kicked off tomorrow evening. So I'm very excited about that. I also do field supervision in the spring semester. So I'm looking forward to supporting our English language arts students in that effort. And I'm looking forward to your getting ready to rock and roll and be ready to get in those classes next year this time. Education program coordinator. I'm teaching uh, characteristics of individuals with disabilities, applied behavior analysis for teachers, those are SPED courses, and um, positive classroom management. Knock, knock. Okay. I just want to see if y'all's going to play. <laughs> I'm uh, Dr. John Crutchfield. I'm new here as well. I'll be working with secondary folks who are in the field this semester, and I also teach social studies methods courses. Dean's Office in the College of Education. 
He's going to talk about digital literacy, something I have no idea what that means. Um, but uh, Brian was recently voted the best looking man on the fifth floor of the <laughs> It's said for a long time up here, it said we're going to have a quiz. So you didn't know on the first day of school you were going to have a quiz, did you? So I think we emailed everybody and said, hey, bring a mobile device and your UTA 10 digit ID number. Now is the time you're going to need that. So let's get out of mobile devices. Because you know when you were in high school, you weren't allowed to have your phone out, right? Guess what? We're going to allow you to have your phone out. So we're going to do a quick, we're going to do just a short quiz. And then I'm going to introduce somebody from the Texas Computer Education Association, or TCEA, and he's going to come talk a little bit more about educational technology as well. So, I lost the clicker. That's okay, I'll put that down, you don't know where you put it. So, here we are right here, we're going to use quizzes. Anybody ever used quizzes before? Raise your hand if you've used that. I would look like two people. Wait, okay, now we're up to like six. Okay, so, Quiz is, is a little bit like Kahoot. How many of you use Kahoot? Oh, see, there's everybody's use Kahoot. All right, so that's why I didn't use Kahoot, is because I wanted to show you a different tool. So you're going to go and open your web browser. You're going to go to join.quizis.com, and then right there it says like enter game code. You got to click on that. And then there's the game code. You click join, and then you put your 10 digit ID in. We got three people in so far. Right. We're going to see if we can break the Wi Fi in the room. That's what we're going to try and do today. Because we have like, you know, 400 people in a room for 350 and See if the Wi Fi can hold well.
I got five people tied for lead. seconds. That's what they were. 
So that's what we were doing right now, is we were just looking to see where we are at the beginning of the year. And then we might come back and look at this again at the end of the year and see where we are. All right, so with that, I want to introduce a little help. We have a representative from the Texas Computer Education Association with us, and he's going to talk a little bit about that organization. Everybody welcome Chance McKee. How are you? Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Good. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for having me. Uh, my name is Chance McKee. I'm the Senior Director of Membership from TCEA. Can any of you tell me what TCEA stands for? <laughs> Come on. Anyone, anyone, anyone. All right. Texas Computer Education Association. All right. Repeat after me, Texas Computer Education Association. Fantastic. So we are actually the largest nonprofit in the state of Texas. And uh, recently, uh, as of the very first week of May, we are the largest nonprofit in the entire United States focused on actually advancing the use of technology in the classroom. Okay, so we are a nonprofit professional organization that focuses on professional development and advocacy for the education industry. Okay, all of you should have received these two pieces of paper. Do you have those? Actually, yeah. I missed like a hundred of you this morning. Um, so all but like a hundred of you this morning should have received these two pieces of paper. If you didn't receive these two pieces of paper, go to www.tcea.org. You can pull out your phone while I'm talking. It's fine. I don't consider it rude in any way, shape, or form. If you have these pieces of paper, go ahead and pull them out of your bag, your pocket, your backpack, your notebook, wherever you shove them. I'll wait. Okay, so the very first one is this piece of paper, okay? This is your application for a free membership to TCEA. Because, of all, because all of you are actually um, uh, pre-service educators, you aren't actually being paid to teach just yet, you receive a free membership to TCEA. It's something that we offer to any pre-service educator throughout the entire United States. As I'm speaking, you're more than welcome to go ahead and fill this out. If you don't have this application, again, if you pulled out your phone and gone to www.tca.org, you can select the free membership on our website. Okay, just fill out your information, select the student membership, and you will start receiving our membership communications. And that is what this second piece of paper is. Do all of you have this? Okay. If you don't have this, that's fine. You can click on the membership tab of the tca.org website, and it explains everything that's on this piece of paper. But I do want to go ahead and run through a couple of these things on the back of this piece of paper. These are all of your member benefits. This is everything that you have full access to, completely for, for free for a full year, as part of your undergraduate, undergraduate student membership with TCA. So the very first one there is free CPE credit. So we offer 80 hours of free CPE credit throughout the entire year for all of our members, okay? You receive the same access to those resources. 80 hours of free CPE credit. What this means is, five years from now when you have to re-up your certification, you have to have those CPE credit to show that you can actually re-up your certification, right? What we do with this, this free CPE credit, these are webinars. You can watch them online, on demand, at your leisure. So if you are sitting at home on the weekend, and you want to log in to www.tca.org using your member ID, you can watch 80 hours of free CPE. Is someone laughing at you now on the weekend? I know. <laughs> you would, yeah, see? So you can log in at your leisure and watch this at your leisure so that you can print that certificate off, put it in a folder. When it comes time to re your certification, you already have it done, okay? Completely for free. The next one here is access to the online TCA social community. So again, as I mentioned, we are the largest nonprofit focused on implementing educational technology in the classroom. We have about 30,000 members throughout the entire United States. So anytime any one of our members has a question, has a concern, uh, a new piece of legislation has just passed and they don't know how to implement it, for instance, Senate Bill 820, are any of you familiar? The new cybersecurity security clauses in there? Okay, well there's a new piece of legislation that just passed and it mandates that every school district has to have a cybersecurity representative. 
So a ton of our members are asking, how do we do this? What are the requirements surrounding it? How do we implement that? Is it a mandated, uh, a funded mandate, or is it an unfunded mandate? So there's tons of questions regarding the legislation. As all of you know, the Texas legislature, as educators in Texas, the Texas legislature dictates what you do in your classroom, on your campus, and within your school district. So a big piece of what TCE does is advocate for you at the Capitol in Austin, Texas. And we encourage all of our members to actually participate in that advocacy as well. So if you look on the back here, you receive important regular updates from the Texas legislature as part of this free membership as well. And the very last thing that I want to mention very quickly is our educator awards and scholarships. Uh, Dr. Brown is actually the chair of our awards and scholarships committee. So if you have any questions on that, feel free to reach out to him. He can answer those, or you can always email me as well. My email is cmcke at tcea.org. And these scholarships open on September 1st. Okay, so in a couple of weeks, September 1st to October 31st, you can submit an application or you can nominate someone else to apply for a scholarship. And again, this is a free process for you, so think of it as free money. It's anywhere between $500 to $1,000 awarded directly to the individual, not to any sort of institution that you may belong to. Okay? Now the very last thing that I want to leave you with, because I, I have a feeling uh, most of us are, are a different age range. Okay? I know you probably wouldn't believe it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, but one of the things that I found really interesting, because I do this quite often, uh, talk to university students throughout the state, um, and over the last couple of years, I've really started to notice that uh, more and more of you are more used to seeing technology in the classroom. Most of you probably grew up using technology in the classroom, right? Show of hands. Yeah. So more of you are more familiar with uh, the actual application of educational technology as a student. But in a recent Speak Up survey, which was all about the use of educational technology in the classroom and students' perception of their use of technology in the classroom, 76% of 6th through 12th graders said that they felt that the use of educational technology bettered their understanding of the content. Okay? Nothing new there. Educators in that same range, 6th through 12th grade, 82% said they also believe that the effective use of technology in the classroom led to their students uh, better comprehending the content that they were providing. Okay? Now the really interesting statistic here is that 93% of students between 6th and 12th grade said their teachers limited the use of technology in the classroom. So if students think that it, it makes them understand the content better, and educators know that it helps their students understand the content better, but students are saying that it's being limited in the classroom, what does it point to? Funding. Funding, big part of it, yeah, 100%. And that's what we do. We, we work on the Capitol Hill to help increase funding for the use of technology in education. But another thing that it points to is that although educators may understand the, the uh, idea of effective use of technology in the classroom, a lot of them don't understand the actual application. How do I, when I have a classroom full of 30 students, maybe more, in front of me, and I'm trying to teach something, uh, a lesson plan that I've just created, how do I then bring in the effective use of technology so my students can understand it better? That's what we do. We work with educators, we provide that professional development, we teach teachers how to use technology in your classroom to reach your students. Because how many of you in here have uh, four, five, six, seven-year-old, ten-year-old, niece, nephew, brother, sister, neighbor down the road, who instinctively, you can hand them an iPad and they instinctively know what to do with it? It's wild. So then when you go into the classroom and you're their teacher and you hand them a piece of paper, a pencil, a book, You've lost them. It's a disconnect. They don't understand how to learn using the instructional materials of yesteryear. Okay? So you have to, as Dr. Doty said, you have to understand how to meet them where they are. 
And a big piece of educational technology is the ability to create educational equity amongst your students. If you look around this room here, it's a diverse population in this room. Your classrooms are going to be just as diverse, if not more so. So whenever, you, whenever you're able to actually apply educational and instructional technology to create content that is more accessible for an entire population of students that you're going to be responsible for, it's a very, very powerful thing. And that's what TCA does. We help you learn how to implement this technology in your classroom. Does anyone have any questions? Yes. Yeah, so my email address, if y'all want to write this down, is C M C K E, so C McKee at TCEA.org. So we have webinars, we actually offer webinars um, throughout the entire year and it's one of the largest uh, ways that we actually provide on-demand learning for educators and for our members. So on Wednesdays from 11.45 to 12.15, and we, we keep this consistent intentionally because even if that, that time frame doesn't work for you, if you pre-register for these lunch and learns, which is what we call them, our webinars, pre-register, you don't attend, you get the recorded link afterwards so you can watch it at, at your leisure and you still receive that CPE credit. So that's one way. Another way is educational events and we do them throughout the entire state. The largest one um, that you'll probably become more familiar as you begin actually teaching and you're in the classroom and you're around uh, experienced educators is our annual con uh, convention that's every February. And this year it's going to be in Austin and it's actually the largest ed tech convention in the entire nation. So about 9,500 attendees, 11,000, um, or 1,100, sorry, um, uh, different sessions that are focused on all types of range of, of uh, use of technology in the classroom. So it could be eSports, it could be digital portfolios for your students, it could be student uh, data and privacy concerns, um, so a, a range of issues. So that's probably the, the most effective way. Yeah, it's actually a really good question. So a regular membership is $49. As students, so the first time that you uh, choose to actually pay for your membership, if you log in using the account you've created here, it'll be $25. So your first year is 25 bucks. Super cheap, same access, same involvement, same treatment as a member, nothing different. Yeah, so um, we've yet to have a webinar fill up uh, because we, we keep the cap pretty pretty high. Um, but yeah, we do send out emails and we let all of our members know when these webinars are coming up. Um, one of the most effective ways to stay engaged with your organization is logging into the social community. That's where a lot of that communication happens. Uh, we post a week before the, the webinar and then the day before as well to remind our members, hey, this webinar is coming up. If you're interested, go ahead and sign up. Again, if you can't attend it live, you will see the recorded link after. Yeah, so it's your ESC region. That's actually a good question. If you're on the website, the area is going to be your ESC region, and you're on region number 11. And actually, Dr. Brown is area 11. Oh yeah, you're not actually. Yeah, yeah that's right, it's Elaine. Yeah. All right, well, thank you all so much. I think I've taken up plenty of your time this morning. If you do have any questions, feel free to send me an email or talk to Dr. Brown. But again, thank you so much, and best of luck this year. <laughs> One other thing I want to throw in there is that uh, the convention, you mentioned the convention, the convention, like I said, is one of the largest in the, in the country. It's in Austin in this next February. A year after that, in 2020, which a lot of you will be student teaching in that 2020, um, it's in Dallas, so it's right in our own backyard. It'll be the first time it's been in Dallas in about 20 years. So, so next we're going to have Denise Collins going to join me, and we're going to talk a little bit about you're going to talk about a little bit about certification and we're the portfolio, right? Okay. So, hi everyone. <laughs> 
Um, I am uh, the assistant dean in charge of the educational field experiences. So all of you at some point in time will be coming through my office to get your field experiences. It's a, it's a big job, look around as you can see, it's a huge job. Um, the person, um, other person that you need to know is Angela Watson, she's my admin. Thank you. Um, and, and, um, and here's how you can reach us at any time. Um, and I just want you to know that you are in a state certification program, which means that pretty much my job is to make sure that you do everything the state requires so that you can be certified. So when you get an email to do something, you don't need to send me an email back that says, is that mandatory? Do I have to do that? Yes, I'm gonna answer that question for you right now. Yes, if we send you an email to do something, you have to do it. Because if you're not, if you don't get that done, then you will not be certified as a teacher. And you do not want to waste four years of your time and then come out not being able to be certified. So pay attention to all of that. Um, you, most of you have gotten an email on all of the little pieces and we have come up with, Brian and I have worked together all summer to come up with a portfolio system in TK20, which most of you are familiar with. And in that portfolio system, we are now going to collect all documents so they don't have to be brought into my office. The one thing that you do have to know is you must apply for field experience through TK20. When you go in to apply for field experience in TK20, you will get several drop-down boxes. It's going to open later this week. Um, if it's not open, you won't be able to see anything in there. But when you create your, your application, you will see a couple of choices in there. Observation only, which means I'm in a class and I just need to observe. If you are a junior in mid-level or EC6 ESL bilingual programs, then you are a junior and you will choose the junior application. If you are in UTeach, you will choose the UTeach application. There's also the field experience application, which will be for all of the other programs. It sounds complicated, but if you think about it, I think you'll get it. And if you have questions, we're always here to answer those questions for you. All right, so we're going to talk a little bit about the portfolio. And as Dr. Collins said, she and I have been working on this all summer to try to get us into a place where you're not having to handle a lot of paper. You're going to be turning things in digitally. Um, and as you know, we moved to the, the learning management system as a university, we moved to Canvas. But Canvas is not a good place for us to store things long term because we need to store these documents so that TEA, the Texas Education Agency, can come review them at any time within five years of your graduation. Okay, so that's why we're using TK20 to do this. And all part of this, Dr. Collins said she's helping make sure of this. We have Christine Pruitt, our certification officer. She is going to review all of these documents before she can click the button that says this person is ready to be certified as a teacher in the state of Texas. Is that clear with everybody? Does everybody understand what we're going to do? So we go to TK20, and everybody's kind of seen this screen before, right? Everybody's logged in, you've seen this. There is a, a, a section we've never used before. It says portfolios. You might have clicked on it accidentally before, and there's nothing there. Now when you click on it, not today, later, maybe next week, you're going to get an email from TK20, and it's going to say you have a portfolio. And when you click on that link, now there's going to be something there. Hopefully it's going to be something that names something a little prettier than the test one that I have in the slideshow that says, like, the time and date that I sent it. So that's your portfolio right there. Everybody's going to have one. It's going to last you from the time you start teacher education until you complete student teaching. So it's two years, three years. If it takes you three years, this portfolio is going to last you that long. When you click on the portfolio, it loads up like this. There are several tabs. The first tab is kind of a landing page. It explains the portfolio. It has some help tips. It tells you where to get help, who to email. There are four other tabs we're going to use. There's one for UTA and TEA required documents. 
one for TEA required trainings. There's a third tab for cooperating teacher documents, UTA supervisor documents, and then there's three more tabs, assessments, or assessment extensions and feedback. Those three tabs we're not using right now. So don't worry about those. You don't need to do anything with those. Those just stay as is. So for the example here, we're going to click on the UTA TEA required documents, and this is what we get. There are four documents in this area that need to be uploaded. Some of them you may have already done. Some of them you may be doing this semester. Some might be next semester. It depends on who you are and where you are in your program, where these, pro where these documents are going to come from. So the first one is acknowledgement of the teacher, of the clinical teaching handbook, liability insurance, and waiver of liability. That's typically done right before you go to student teach. It might be right now if you're student teaching in the spring. It depends on the program, but you click on select and it takes you to another page. But before I go there, I want to talk about, I circled these two buttons down here at the bottom, submit and save. That submit button, it, it's drawing you, it's green. It wants to be pushed, right? Do you know how many times in your life you're going to push that green submit button? Once, yeah, very good guess. One time. When you are done with the entire portfolio is the only time you submit it. If you click submit beforehand, we'll have to figure out how to fix that. <laughs> Don't do it. No, we'll have to return the portfolio to you, and I'm going to have to get involved and help you do that. And we don't want to do that. So we want to use the one right next to it. Let's see if this works. Look, that one right there. Save. That's the one we want to use. We're only going to click that green submit button the last time. You're done. Everything's uploaded. We're done. You're, so you're looking at graduation is what you're doing. Okay? When you click that submit button. So let's look at, if I click this select button right here, that button right there, it's going to go to a screen like this. Now, this is only the bottom part of the screen. There's a couple more paragraphs up at the top of things to read. So you're going to read this whole page. You're going to type your name right here in this, right here. It auto fills your name, and then you type your name here. It's kind of like a digital signature. You've signed into your TK20 using your NetID and password. We know it's you that's there. But you're typing your name and say, hey, yes, I've read this and I am going to abide by this. Then there's a place to upload a document, and it is the confirmation of liability insurance. So right here. Now there every one of the sections in the portfolio has a place for additional documents. Not every page is going to use additional documents. This one's probably not. But let's talk about when you're doing a field observation in one of your first classes. And you have to do a log, right? You have to record your hours, you have to turn that in. It's going to go in here in one of these tabs. But let's say while you're doing that, the teacher gives you some lesson plans, a seating chart, other documentation about your experiences while you're doing those field experiences or doing those observations. Absolutely appropriate to add that stuff into that additional area down there. Is it required? No. But it's probably a good idea to add, hey, you know what, I have all this other stuff that went with these field experiences, I'm going to put it in here too. Does that make sense to everybody? So let's recap. Where is the portfolio? When are you going to get it assigned to you? Next week, 10 days. Do not use that fancy submit button. I know it's green, it's pretty, you want to click it. Don't click that button. It will stop you from adding any more documents to your portfolio. Use the save button. There are, there's already a click through sheet, like a click sheet on the Office of Educational Experiences Handbooks page. So if you've been there, it was added yesterday. So there's already a, a click sheet that kind of walks you through the different slides that we just looked at in a little more detail. And later this week, there'll also be a video. So the video, we've got to get some things done to it, some editing done to it to get it to be ready to be uploaded. So, that is the end for me. Any questions about the portfolio before I walk away?
have an accident with no luck with battery today. Okay. Okay, so I am Dr. Diane Lennon. I am in the College of Liberal Arts. <laughs> There's my students. Yeah. I'm in music, and, um, and I'm going to talk to you about dispositions and professionalism. This is very, very important that we cover this topic. This is a module that is required. It will be as one of those.
so pleased that her teachers are so committed to her learning. And that's where you come in. You're going to be that teacher. You're going to help her. You're going to talk. I, I'm not going to say, you're going to talk her off the bridge. Because there's been several times. I mean, she, she comes home. I'm so stupid. I can't do this. I'm like, we, well, let's talk to Ms. Craig, who's a dyslexia teacher. And so, uh, so it is so important that her teachers know that she can do anything, even if she has dyslexia. So remember that. So I want you to be completely committed to learning. And then here's the rubric.
Sean, that's my student's name too. I was like, oh, I wish I had Sean. Uh, but there, Sean was a little darling everywhere, everywhere he was a little skater, except for in music. That was the only place that he was successful. So, um, so everybody's like, oh, Sean, I'm like, I love him. And it took me a while to love him. It was a little, little love thing. Um, but uh, but you, need, you need to stay positive. You need to say, yes, that student is well in my subject. It's not where I am. And be very positive about that. And, um, and to help that child. And, um, and it was so funny because Sean was, I mean, he was the boy that would beat up five kids before the bell rang. <laughs> on the bus, he'd take somebody down. And getting off the bus, he literally would take them down. And um, he would just go out and beat everybody up. So he would come hang out with me in the mornings. <laughs> and he would control himself on the playground. And, um, and so you need to come up with those solutions. But you need, you need to make sure that you are staying positive. All right, the next one is making sure that you are culturally sensitive. If you're in school and you're not sure, you need to talk to somebody, ask questions. Please don't think that asking is a sign of weakness. When you get into um, in your first year of teaching, you need to have a mentor. You need to have somebody you can go and you need to talk and ask questions. Um, there were always times, uh, for example, being a music teacher. Do you or don't you do Halloween? You know, so that's our that's always our thing. You know, what what can we do at holiday time? What can you? So you need to have those people. You need to find out when you enter a new school and you're in this new population. You need to find out what is acceptable and what not to say, and have somebody that you feel really comfortable with to ask anything. You need to make sure that you are able to ask, and make sure that you have once again have somebody read your email. And so within our professional community, we need to really make sure um, that I always loved the, um, the I don't know if you've seen like this, I don't know if you've seen three. So the Cinderella with Lily James, Lily James had courage and be kind. And so, um, so we need to make sure that we always are very kind, we are fair, you need to be fair with your students and equitable. And these are things that you're going to work on in your classes, things that you'll learn when you're in the school teaching. All right, you need to make sure that you are responding positively. If you have to count three, if you have to just, you know, sit to hold your breath or whatever, I don't care, just to calm down. There, I truly believe that there are students put in our classrooms, put on this earth, just to push your buttons. And to sit there and see, oh, can I make their nose flare? Can their ears turn red? Can I get them to wear their bottom lip for them? I don't know. But they sit there and they'll figure it out, and they'll treat you like a little wind-up boy. You're like, Ooh, always say, I am the adult. <laughs> because sometimes when the kids start debating with you, you can go down with them. So you need to really make sure that you're calm, positive, and that you're, you're actually patient with them at all times. And, uh, and one thing that I told my son, my son is a freshman uh, this year, and, uh, and I told him, I said, you are now starting your professional reputation. And I had written two letters of recommendation. And, um, and so in the two letters of recommendation, and uh, in the two letters of recommendation for master's students, I put that the one student has potential to succeed in a graduate program. The other one, I said she's a good thinker, she pays attention to detail, she's always on time, she's organized. Which one is going to get in? You know, so you want to be the one that has a really glowing recommendation. This is important. This could result in a digression. This is where the rumors are going to come in. When I had you click on that uh, website and go look at the rumors, this is what we're going to be filling out. So you need to make sure that you are communicating at our time. You need to make sure that you are turning into a teacher. Very important. All right, you need to make sure that you are honest. And, uh, and you have to really, really be careful about gossiping and uh, complaining. You need to make sure that you are not gossiping. That's low confidentiality. You cannot sit there and come home and work or well, you can vent to the family. But uh, only for 30 minutes and stop. That's not <laughs> and, um, my husband needs to set the microwave. But he goes, okay, after 30 minutes, you have to stop. <laughs> because you can't. Sometimes you And 
inappropriately, and on the other side of the partition was that student's name. Okay, so think about confidentiality. Think about how important it is. Think about your code of ethics. Think about how you're going to behave as a teacher. Okay? Please don't gossip. Please don't complain. Don't talk about them at a restaurant. Maybe the next table is the parent or the grandmother or the grandmother. You know, you need to really think about the confidentiality. All right, let's talk about personal appearance. I'm going to go through this real quickly. Um, you have to really make sure that you are dressed professionally. I had a student once that said, oh, yeah, I shower at the end of the day because I'm going to get all greasy and grimy and gross with the students all day. I was like, oh, that's good. Your students have been lucky. Um, so, um, so please make sure that you are poised and you are, are dressed professionally and you are using appropriate hygiene. Um, because they got to be in the room with you all day. And hopefully, then, then, you know, in fifth and sixth grade, then you have to be over and talk with them. So, um, so it goes both ways. All right, so let's talk a little bit about you have to check the dress code. And um, we, had, we had lots of talk. Here I have a little talk, and I point to Brian. Brian, so Brian wants to teach. <laughs> he wants to teach some parts of these texts, he can't have a beard. So you need to just go and check the dress code for where for where you are. So you need to really think about that. Um, we have some pictures coming up that I want to show you. Um, I don't want you to sit there and go, oh, I'm going to be a teacher and crash this out the window. Well, actually, you have to just make sure that you are dressing appropriately. If you are really going to be fashionable at 4 o'clock, change. And, um, and then you can actually have to go back to that. All right, now, uh, close toed shoes recommended. You need to make sure that you are checking. I had a very strange principal once who, uh, her big thing was toes, tummy, shoulders. And um, this is when I was teaching at my face. It's 126. And I had just a sweater vest on. It was just like, it was just a sleeveless sweater vest. She sent me home for a jacket because you can see my shoulders. Okay. So she got another school. And, uh, and then she came out Halloween dressed as a devil with a bunch of spaghetti strap, red dress. And I had the first grade teacher came up and was going to tell her to go home. <laughs> no, I want to keep my job. Thank you very much. Um, but um, so you need to make sure you know your dress code. Start looking at dress code. See, there's some interesting ones. Um, dress codes are hard to find. Do you guys remember in class when we had such a time trying to find my dress code? Dress codes are kind of hard to find on websites. It's almost like they have a teacher dress. Um, but you need to make sure you understand the dress code. All right. You need to make sure that um, that you are not, there you go, that, um, that when you teach and you bend over, you're not revealing everything. So, um, so you really have to think about the, um, the click, the arm actually has a two inch linkage rule. You have to be two inches above your cleavage. You need to make sure when you go like this that we're not seeing your tummy. Um, my mom used to do a rule when we would go to high school. We only had to bend over. She would stand at the end of the hallway and, um, Oh, what? If your butt cheeks to the day, you yeah, have to go change. You know, so think about like after school when you're putting on hair shorts and you're going to be ordered. Like last night at Martin High School was first event. Um, and uh, and it's after school to ask you uh, how many of Martin High School people are here. Right? How crazy it is at first event where there's like 8,000 people stuffed into the gym while the air conditioning wasn't working. And um, and it was and they sell all spirit wear and all the, the everything. It's just crazy. And there were a couple teachers that I was like, ooh, you know, it's hot, but you really want to wear that. So think about your image. Think about uh, what people are going to say about you and things that they don't need to know about you. So make sure that you are very careful. Um, that, like, I teach early childhood, I teach birth to five, so I have to on Saturday morning. So I have to really be careful on Saturdays when I go. Because on Saturdays, I'm like really comfortable. Well, if I have a certain top on, I mean, their, my, their hand is down my shirt. Teaching kindergarten, uh, their hand is up your skirt. So I always wear shorts <laughs> underneath my dresses because you look, and I had once I was sitting there and I was like, I had a little boy standing under my dress. And I was like, okay. And <laughs> think about some of these things that surprise. And I popped out and went, ha! And I was like, Little, they don't get it. Totally. And, um, and, um, <laughs> we 
you are professional at all times. Yes, you, I, we want you to have fun too. Um, and so, but, but make sure that you know how to flip the switch when you're a teacher, when you have to go into teacher mode and get there and make sure that you are, you are being as professional as possible. So, thank you. I'll answer any one of you 